Now please open your Bibles. Good evening. Good evening. To 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm uh, somewhat hesitant to bring tonight's message because my confidence is so badly shaken because Melissa threw my notes away. <laughs> Had them freshly printed, went to park the truck, came back, and they were gone. Sitting on my Bible, she took them and threw them in the trash. And she said, that little bitty outline you had? <laughs> she threw them away. So, I just... I will qualify and preface the message this evening by just telling you my wife threw my notes away. <laughs> some people say you get your sermons from your preacher, or from your some preachers get their sermons from their wives. Some some preachers get their sermons thrown away by their wives. You know the joke, right, about the about the preacher and the eggs? You've probably heard that one a million times. It's a regurgitated preacher joke. The uh, preacher was moving got a new home, and they were moving out. And he was just gotten in the, in the closet of his bedroom. He really didn't go on his wife's side of the closet. And as he's moving things, he noticed a uh, just a little box, a shoe box. And uh, he opened it, and it had a whole bunch of uh, dollar bills in it, like $1,000 bills, and uh, an egg. And so he couldn't figure it out. He, went ahead and tucked it away while his wife wasn't home while he's moving and put him, you know, took care of it because it had a thousand dollars in it. And uh, when he saw his wife the next time after he got done moving, he said, oh, by the way, he said, when I was moving the things in your closet, I saw a shoebox with a thousand dollar, one dollar bills and an egg in it. And she said, oh, okay, thank you. And she just started to take it from him and put it away. And he said, well, what is it? What's the deal with that? What's the deal with the egg? And she said, oh, nothing. And he said, nothing what? And she said, well, I don't really want to say. And he said, well, you tell me anyway. And she said, well, years ago when you started preaching, she said, Dad, whenever you preach a good sermon, you know, I've always appreciated that. She said, every now and again, you'd lay an egg. And so she said, I just put an egg in the box whenever you preach a sermon where you laid an egg. And uh, he said, wow. He said, after all these years, there's only one egg. She said, well. <laughs> he said, well, what? She said, well, every time I got a dozen, I sold them for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> My wife doesn't have eggs. She just throws my outline away. <laughs> Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Father, please help us tonight as we look at a message on the rights of a minister. Help us to arrive at the conclusion of what the Scripture teaches and then help us to be able to know how to properly apply the same. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you study the letters of Paul, you find oftentimes as he's writing the churches, there are a lot of circumstances that surround his letters. And the letters to the churches all are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, within the letters is an indication. Paul knew what he was writing was more than just a personal letter to a church which he and a team of ministers had established. He knew he was writing a letter to uh, represent the Holy Spirit of God. He also knew that the office of an apostle was temporary. And that one day, the apostles and prophets would be the New Testament of the Scripture. And so, he knew when he was writing, was inspired. There's still that personal sense to it. As you minister and as you do ministry, sometimes you can relate, sometimes you can't relate to circumstances of people. And the Apostle Paul was an individual that I have just really in the last couple of years really seen this theme of unpopularity in his ministry. It seems absurd to me that someone with the testimony and with the results 
the proof of the ministry that the Apostle Paul had would ever be challenged regarding the legitimacy of their apostleship or would ever be disliked. Now, no one in this room would dislike the Apostle Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody here, we're all Apostle Paul fans, right? We wouldn't be part of the people that would say, I'm of Apollos or I'm of Cephas, mm -hmm. and meaning I don't like Paul, I like these guys instead. No, we're Paul guys because we know better than to dislike a minister, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's incredible when Paul writes his letters to Timothy and when he writes to the church at Philippi that he indicates the dislike that brethren had for him. It's incredible to me. I just think, how could you dislike someone who was so greatly used, who really was the preeminent apostle in the early church? Paul was. Well, of course, yeah, jealousy, a lot of things, a lot of reasons why. Uh, you know, it, it could be more than just jealousy. Uh, truth is not always popular. People don't always want to be challenged about the way that they're living and be told that this is what God says, this is what you're doing, they're not the same, you're not right. People don't like to be challenged about being in sin or about not loving God with all their heart. And uh, so the job of the apostle would have been to give truth. And truth and right are not always popular. Paul indicated in several of his letters that it was a minority who loved him. Well, here is in this part of 1 Corinthians, we're going to see uh, Paul's uh, rights as a minister. He's going to defend his rights as a minister to the church. Now, a couple of weeks ago, but when we were in the uh, series on fornication, uh, we saw that the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, well, I, you know what, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, first of all, this evening, I just want to stick with our text tonight. And uh, I want to look at Paul's qualifications, first of all, uh, to be an Apostle. His qualification to be an Apostle, because that's something he just defended over and again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul defended his qualification to be an Apostle. And we, so here we see in verse 1 of chapter 9, Paul said, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? What is he referencing here? Well, he's saying, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? He's speaking of qualifications for an apostle. Now you say, Pastor, this is rather dry, dull, and boring. You know, we know Paul was qualified to be an apostle. Well, that leads us then to the qualifications for being an apostle and asking us the question, then what about other people who claim to be apostles? Uh, dear people contact me sometimes and they say, I'm apostle so-and-so. And I'm left with the responsibility to say, no, you are not. No, you're not. You're not an apostle. Why? Well, because you have not been an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus. You ever see the church van? You know, uh, Holy Church of the Deliverance of the Firstborn, uh, Seed of David, King of the Jews, Resurrected, uh, and Coming Again, Church led by the Holy Apostle, uh, blah, 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 and the long name title for the Right Reverend Holy Apostle, so and so. And uh, there are a lot of people that call themselves prophets today and call themselves apostles, and they're not. They are not. How do we know they're not? Well, uh, if you turn to Acts chapter 1 real quickly, I'd like to just look at uh, some of the qualifications for the apostle. Acts chapter 1, this is when Judas was being replaced. The, the apostles appointed Matthias to, to take his position. And let's debate this just a little bit. Did the apostles have the responsibility or right to replace Judas with Matthias? Because, you know, God replaced Judas, or God, uh, God appointed as an apostle out of due time the apostle Paul. So did the, uh, did the apostles get ahead of themselves? Did they appoint someone when it's Jesus that appoints apostles? Well, here's the answer to that question. You don't know and I don't know. We know what they did. 
The scripture does not anywhere indicate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, there is scripture that says about. Uh, His bishopric take must ways. another man take. Yes. Yeah, that's in Psalms. That's quoted in Acts chapter one, and that's what the apostles. That's what the apostles were uh, concerned with fulfilling when they appointed Matthias as an apostle. And here's a simple answer to it. The answer is that you and I think there have to be twelve apostles, but there are more, and you could study how many apostles there actually there actually were, and there. Uh, and so forth, but the reality of it is, is God's Word doesn't say this is how many apostles that there have to be. We are simply told what uh, the believers, what the apostles did in the early church, and there's no commentary on it. There's no, this is right or this is wrong. No, there's just no commentary on it. But we are told the qualification for the apostle, and in the text that Mrs. Dollins is quoting here in Acts chapter 1, which quotes Psalm, go down to verse... Uh, 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. So 120 disciples. Uh, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And let's stop here just for a minute. Now, the Lord Jesus had died on the cross. He had been buried, and he had been raised from the dead. And at this point, at this stage, he had also ascended into heaven. It is fascinating to me, and, and uh, just a matter of, I think, importance for us to note that the apostles took the matter of apostleship seriously. Why is that? Well, because their job was to establish the church. And if Judas had had a share in establishing the church, if he'd had a portion or a requirement in establishing the church, in their minds he needed to be replaced. See, a lot of times we don't think very much about the church Today, with the popularity of replacement theology, like replacement theology has always been popular, so perhaps I ought to qualify it by saying today, but with replacement theology where Israel has been replaced uh, with the church in many people's theology, there is a real admixture uh, between uh, the, ger the church and Israel. And the apostles really understood here very, very plainly that they were establishing something new. There had been no church. When Jesus said, on this rock, I'll build my church, he was talking about something they hadn't seen before. And this called out or gathered together uh, assembly, which was established in Jerusalem, was not Israel. It did not have uh, the priesthood. It did not have the sacrifices. It had a once-for-all sacrifice. It did not have a priest who stood daily ministering in the temple. It had Jesus Christ who, after offering his own blood one time, sat down. And so, it is a different institution. The church is different than Israel. God has future plans someday with Israel. God will be doing some marvelous things someday. And Israel will have their king, and they'll have the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the thousand-year reign, will be a reign with Israel. It's not the church. And so, when we look at apostles, we need to understand that the apostles were foundational gifts to the church. And we see in the text that the apostles took the fulfillment of the prophecy, which was necessary for the church, very seriously. And so, they, they quoted Psalms. They said uh, in verse... Well, they're talking about uh, Judas and his death. Verse 20, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric... Let another take. Wherefore of these men, notice verse 21, these are qualifications for an apostle. Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. You see the qualification for an apostle in verse 21. Do you see it? It's apparent, it's plain as a nose on your face. The individual, in order to be qualified to be an apostle, had to have been with them during the ministry of the Lord Jesus and to participate with the apostles. There is an implied qualification, and that is that the apostles must recognize the apostleship of an apostle. 
You see that as well? So the accompanying among us, you see them. There's 120 disciples that were witnesses of the resurrection. And so evidently the apostles are saying, you know, these 120 that we're here with are uniquely qualified. They're uniquely qualified to choose out from among them an apostle. And then there are some more requirements for an apostle that were mentioned. Uh, in verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Bersabbas, and who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, boy, I love that verse, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of the ministry, this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So who are the twelve apostles? Well, subtracting Judas, all the other ones, and Matthias. Okay, so then Paul. Because of this, Paul comes under a great deal of fire, doesn't he? Now, when Paul was first converted, uh, we know that he describes a, an experience that he had uh, whether in the body or out of the body, he said, I cannot tell, the Lord knoweth. But he was caught up to the third heaven, and he was taught by the Lord Jesus himself. We know Paul would have been an eyewitness, uh, certainly of John the Baptist. He would have been an eyewitness of Jesus from the time period of, uh, the, of excuse me, from the time period of Je Jesus' baptism with the John the Baptist. Probably the Apostle Paul would have been among those Pharisees that came down to the river when Jesus was coming to be baptized of John the Baptist. And probably, now I'm speculating here, but I'm just saying probably, we know the apostles recognized Paul's qualification to be an apostle. Now he certainly would not have been a believer at that time. He would have been an unbeliever, but he certainly also would have seen the Lord Jesus and probably saw when God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now I'm not going to harp on that or spend a great deal of time on that this evening because I'd rather speak about what we do know more so than what we are speculating on. That is speculation. And I'll leave that for you, but I'm probably right about it. When we get to heaven, we'll ask the question. Because there are a lot of people who say, well, Paul was probably not there at the baptism of John the Baptist, so how is he qualified to be an apostle? Well, let me help you with something. The 11 men who are here in the presence of the 120 disciples thought Paul was qualified. And that seems to me, uh, it seems as though they understood the qualification. Is it not so? Luke, who wrote Acts, the Holy Spirit used Luke to pen Acts. He wrote this and he also wrote about the ministry of Paul and recognized Paul as an apostle. So Luke wasn't confused about the qualifications for apostles either. And so I don't think we are speculating very much to simply say the apostles were satisfied and so then, who am I? In other words, they were very careful in selecting Matthias. And they would not have been less careful in acknowledging Paul, whom the Lord Jesus selected. And so I just think that's a, that's a help. That's just free. It's for you. And we want you to have it, to quote Dr. McClure. All right. Now, uh, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You can see how, uh, how uh, elaborate my short outline that's not even worth keeping is from all the information that's... Uh, unrecognizable in it. Uh, <laughs> poor Melissa. You know I'm teasing her. She knows I'm teasing you. I hope you do too. One thing about her is she has a great sense of humor. Another thing about her is she'll get me back. All right. <laughs> Verse 1. Paul says, it's touching the ministering to the saints. It's superfluous for me to write unto... Oh, that's 2 Corinthians. I was like, that's not what it's supposed to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not an apostle? What's the answer to the question? Yes, you are, Paul. Am I not free? What's the answer to the question? Yes, you are, Paul. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And what's the answer to that question? Yes. Well, you say you have. Well, he said he had, and the apostles recognized that he'd been with the Lord Jesus. They knew that he knew uh, Jesus. Okay, so we've seen Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, let's just look at 
uh, verse 7 and 8 and 9. This is Paul talking about the gospel, which is that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And then he goes on to, to talk about his apostleship or his call to be an apostle as well. So, in verse 7, after that, speaking of Jesus, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. And then he goes on to say, For I am the least of the apostles that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And you say, well, I agree, Paul. You were a murderer. You were a blasphemer. You opposed Jesus himself. You persecuted Christ himself. I agree, you're not qualified to be an apostle. And then Paul mentions something that sort of does away with that notion. But by the grace of God, I am but what I am. Aren't you glad for the grace of God? Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Paul said, I'm not qualified in and of myself, but I'm qualified by God. God qualified me to be an apostle. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 15. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so here Paul defends again his apostleship. There are other places where he speaks of being born out of due time, he talks about his apostleship. But I want to just look at this evening what 1 Corinthians 9 actually is going to deal with, and that is that Paul is going to mention here his rights as an apostle, the rights of an apostle, or we could just simply say the rights of a minister. Now, I first of all want to say today we don't have apostles. Well, actually that's an inaccurate statement, isn't it? Today we do not have uh, individuals who are apostles, today we have a book which is called the Apostles and Prophets. The Word of God. The New Testament of the Scripture is the Apostles. And so everything the Holy Spirit wanted us to have from the Apostles, we have in this book. Now people uh, will say, well I'm a prophet. You know my response to most prophets is, and again, you know sometimes I may seem, seem surly or, uh, or uh, to be rather abrupt in the way I answer things, but I want to be direct Sometimes, just so people don't under, misunderstand the facts uh, for the... You know, sometimes politeness misses the point. Sometimes when you're too polite about something, you miss the point. And when someone tells me they're an apostle or they're, they're a prophet, my first thought is, I don't need you. Somebody tells me they're an apostle, what they're implying is that the Word of God is not enough. That's what they're implying. I have a truth for you. I have a message for you. I have a commandment for you to which I say, I've got enough of those. The ones I have are sufficient. I've had people come to me as prophets with special messages. And friend, without being struck dead, I have refused to hear the message. Why? Well, because when someone claims to have something more than what the Word of God says then my friend, I don't, want to, I don't want to hear it. When somebody wants to contradict what the Word of God says. The last couple of verses in Revelation tell us about the curses that are to be added to a person who takes away from the words of this prophecy or that adds to the words of this prophecy. Amen. I don't have any use for it. I don't want it. I don't want to be part of your curse. We need prophecy. Now, if the Holy Spirit's shown you something and you have the Word of God to corroborate it. Corroboration's the word of the week. And it's a fine word for us folks, isn't it? When it comes to this is what the Scripture says and this is the message from God. You show me that Scripture says it, my friend, then it's for me. But we have the apostles today. We don't need more apostles. We don't need new witnesses. We have the witness of the Scripture. And you as a believer ought to formally reject an individual who labels themselves an apostle. Now, uh, an apostle also, of course, had a burden of proof. We'll see that in our text this evening. Paul mentioned uh, that their work... Oh, look at this word, corroborating. There needs to be a work corroborating uh, the apostle. Much like a prophet, the work of an apostle was a commendation. In other words, you know what a commendation is? It's, it's when you are commended to someone or something. It is a presentation. Paul said in verse 1, 
one of the evidences that he was a legitimate apostle, as opposed to individuals which would say they are apostles and are not, was that they were his work in the Lord. An individual, hear me now, this is, this is an important distinction. An individual who would be, or would have been an apostle in Paul's time, would have, would have won followers to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to himself. A legitimate apostle would have gained followers for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's precisely what happened at Corinth. Who are the first individuals uh, to be born again at Corinth? Christmas. Christmas. Remember Christmas? When God did the great work there? <laughs> the leader of a synagogue? The Jews. And that was a miracle, wasn't it? At that point, Paul had come to the place when he went to, to Corinth, he'd come to the place of saying, I'm done preaching to Jews. I'm done with them. They mock, they scorn, they scoff, they reject. They're hard-hearted. They oppose themselves. They oppose the gospel. I'm finished with the Jews. And his next convert was <laughs> the leader of a synagogue. <laughs> there was quite a work done in Corinth. It was the first place that the Apostle Paul had a ministry for more than a week or two. He was actually able to stay there almost a couple of years and have a peaceful hiatus in his ministry. And so Paul is saying to a church which is now questioning his apostleship, you're the proof of my apostleship. Now, uh, earlier when I referenced uh, 1 Corinthians uh, and chapter 6, or chapter 5 is what I intended uh, to, to reference, I believe it's chapter 5, where Paul talks about uh, how they have, no, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 15. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many followers, fathers, I'm sorry. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. That is a strong evidence in Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, which supports what he says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1. You're my work in the Lord. He said, I have begotten you in the gospel. A mark of an apostle is that they preach the gospel. Mark of an apostle is that they preach the gospel. You know, today, most individuals that want the title, they, want, they wear the label, they have other marks. Instead of creating followers for the Lord Jesus Christ, they create followers unto themselves. That's their first mark. Secondarily, instead of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they usually preach another gospel. They normally preach another gospel whether it is signs and tongues and healing, whether it is the health and wealth and prosperity gospel, whether it is, and that normally is the present day apostles gospel, whether it is the signs and wonders, all the things which promote themselves and also expose themselves as charlatans rather than actual apostles. And so, it's important for us as believers. You say, Pastor, you don't sound very nice. I know. It's a generational tendency. And uh, you need to be very, very gracious and forgiving to me for being very, very abrupt mm -hmm. and uh, very, very uh, forthright uh, about what I say. I just can't help it. I wasn't privileged to be a millennial. And so, uh, you know, I just, I ought to be, I ought to be arbitrarily forgiven uh, for my personality. Okay, so moving forward uh, this evening, and the only way I know how to communicate sometimes. The Apostle Paul then mentions, and this really is more to the point of what he's getting to in the text, his right to partake in the privilege of a ministry. And of course, he references the, the law, which really showed God's mercy toward animals or beasts. Verse, eight, verse uh, 7, he begins by saying, "...who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges." Who planteth the vineyard, and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? It's a cruel thing to have an individual labor at something from which they cannot reap a reward. It's a cruel thing. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to go too far with this. But I think it's just fine for restaurant workers to get free food. I just think it's fine. You say, well, pastor, they get paid. Yes. And that could be a substitute for their free food. 
But, uh, you know, I just don't have a problem with, hey, part of the job is you get free food. Because it sort of has a principle that's reflected in the benevolent nature of our God. Who, the text points out, was, is more concerned about humans than he is beasts. A couple of times in the Bible, we're told that Jesus is more concerned with individuals who are made in his image than he is with animals. Remember in uh, Matthew chapter 6, for instance, when Jesus is talking about not taking thought and being concerned for the morrow, and he talks about how that the lilies of the field God cares about, he cares about the sparrows, and shall he not, not much more care for you, O ye of little faith. God cares more about you than he does about sparrows. But in the Old Testament law, there's a provision that when you put a, an oxen, and usually they would, I think, usually put them on a like just a circular uh, pattern, or just just a, you know, you've seen these things that you know that you just go round and round and round on like a mill. And what they would do would be put the grain on the on the ground in the husk, and as the oxen would go round and round, you know, as he stepped on the corn, he would tread it out, and so pretty soon you just get chaff, and then you could winnow it, and the chaff would blow away. And as the oxen would be going along, he'd dip his head and he, without stopping, lick the floor with his tongue and he'd get some grain. And sometimes the person who was driving the oxen would forbid it. You know, they wouldn't let the oxen, you stay here, you dirty, dirty oxen, quit eating the corn. You know, and uh, God was very merciful toward oxen. and just said, you know, it's cruel to have him uh, participating in the labor of reaping the corn and then not be able to participate in the reward of it. And if God is so concerned about oxen, He's also concerned with people. You better not be a skin flint and a miser and try to represent the Lord Jesus, my friend. I'm serious. God doesn't like skin flints. doesn't like miserly people. Individuals who uh, want to just squeeze the blood out of a turnip and uh, then uh, cast away the turnip. And uh, God, is, God loves generous people. And if anyone in the world ought to be benevolent, and generous, it is ought to be people who know a benevolent and generous God. And so it's just an important part of the law. And so here now Paul is talking to a church, get this, to a church which is begrudging him being taken care of by them. In other words, they're saying, why should we have to support Paul? Well, there is a little matter of eternal damnation that they are exempt from because of his ministry. What do you owe someone that preached the gospel to you? <laughs> what do you want? Right? I mean, is Paul asking, you know, give me your own lives, give me all your give me all your money, give me everything. You're my chattel, you're my slaves now. Is that what he's saying? No. no. Tragically though, he's having to defend his ministry. Say, you know something, you're, you have eternal life because the Lord used me as an apostle in your midst, in your church. I don't want to take care of Him. I want to support Him. You're saying, who does He think He is? Expecting us to pay for Him. You know, who does He, who does he think He is? Well, let me ask you a question. How, how effective could Paul be if they don't take care of Him? It's just a practical matter. And he's pointing it out, and he's uh, qualifying his apostleship, his, the rights of a minister. Who goeth the warfare any time at his own charge? Who planteth the vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? You ever see a cook who does not uh, sample the food? I'll tell you two things you can't trust. A skinny cook, right? It's true. A skinny cook, and a, a cook who doesn't try, uh, doesn't taste test. You know, the recipe, you're a recipe follower. I don't mean to be, I'm not being unkind. I'm not being, that's a good start, good place to begin, right? Now, I tell people, Betty Crocker is everybody's friend. But you've got to go beyond that. You've got to get past that someday. And so, uh, I'm, not, I'm not against somebody following the recipe uh, and getting it exactly the way Betty Crocker says it has to go. And she is the gold standard, really, for basic food. But the reality of it is that when it gets really good, it's when the cook is really involved in the process and adding a little seasoning. Remember a guy who used to cook for the TVA uh, when they were doing the big project in Kentucky and Tennessee, the tri-state uh, tri, uh, uh, area. And uh, one of the things he used to talk about, he 
he'd say, you know, he said, secret of cooking. He said, a little more butter and a little bit more sugar. And he said, you know, he said, any, you see, you can take a cake recipe, and he said, it'll be all right. He said, but you add a little butter, and you add a little more sugar. And he said, it'll be a little better. And, uh, you know, I appreciate a guy like that. And, uh, you know, a real cook tastes. They participate in what they cook, don't they? They try it just a little bit. Now, they don't put the spoon back in after they sample it. They put the spoon in the sink, and they get another one. They use good hygienic methods. Well, they should, okay? Uh, so, uh, a couple of rules. But a, a real cook tries what they're serving, right? It, you know, there's been some real tragedies when a cook presents something, you know, that looks really good, and then they find out, uh-oh, oh, something's missing, or something's added, or something's replaced. And uh, if I tasted it ahead of time, I'd know, but I didn't sample it. And so, oh, no, we're in trouble. All right, well, that's the idea. You plant a vineyard, you test it. You, you cook something, you taste it. Now, Paul said this, Say I these things as a man... And they're like, yeah, Paul, you know, you just, you know, this, this is just an argument that you're making because it's good for you. No, he said, or saith not the law the same also, for it's written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the, ox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of the oxen? What's the answer to that question? Yes. Or saith he it all together for our sakes? Well, it's yes and no. Because for our sakes, Paul said, no doubt it is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So a person who's working ought to have a desired outcome. I have a positive outcome. Hey, I'll tell you what, go work really, really hard and expect nothing. Expect to be worse off in the end than when you began. Sometimes we expect that of Lord's ministers, tragically enough. Sometimes we expect people to serve the Lord and end up with less than they began with, or to go their own expense or their own charge. Sometimes, you know, almost always. I've heard it said, uh, for instance, I've heard people say, well, you know, in the United States, you know, we shouldn't pay pastors. I've heard that a lot of times. In the United States, we shouldn't pay pastors. Well, I, you know what, I'm okay with tent making, actually. I'm fine with a preacher supporting himself, and I recognize the value, especially like in a church plant, of a preacher just meeting people and laboring and working alongside of people so that he can... Uh, so that he can minister to them. There ought to come a day, though, when the ministry grows to where 100% of his time is demanded. And when that comes to be the case, he ought to be taken care of. And the Bible says that they that labor well, they're worthy of double honor. Now, there are qualifications, and that's the last thing I want to look at before we make our conclusion this evening. The qualification is that there does need to be proof of the ministry. There are individuals that think that the diploma or the ordination certificate are the qualification of the ministry. And actually it isn't so. The lives that are changed are the qualification for the ministry. You have an individual who wants to come to church and all they can do is pick fights with people and run them out and argue with people and uh, cause trouble in people's lives and he doesn't show any of the graces and he's not fatherly, he's not loving toward his people. My friend... Now stop paying him. He'll leave because he's in it for the wrong reasons anyway. I just That's the way I feel about it. Uh, people ought to be able to say, because of the ministry, my life was changed. My life is effective. This is what is happening because of the ministry. And Paul is really pointing that out in the text here. He's saying, you're, you know, the proof that I'm a legitimate apostle is the fact that you're born again. That there's a church in Corinth which was established by me, we're having this discussion because I was an effective apostle. And therefore, I'm worthy of being taken care of. Verse 11, he concludes by saying, uh, it's the burden of responsibility. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He says, if, if we've sown in you spiritual things, we ought to reap in, from you carnal things. And that's just practical. Uh, a lot of times preachers will have someone else come in and preach this message in their church because they don't want to toot their own horn and so forth. But I'll just be honest with you, I don't have a problem at all uh, just saying that a church that doesn't support its pastor uh, is a church that either has a pastor who isn't worth supporting or it's a church that isn't doing what they ought to be doing. It's one or the other. 
In the one case, you need to get rid of the fellow and get somebody worth supporting. In the other case, you need to do what the Bible says and support him. And I just I feel uh, that that's the correct interpretation of verse 11. And then he goes on to point out, you know, you begrudge me, but you don't begrudge others. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we've not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And here's Paul's conclusion. Ultimately, he said, this is my right, but I do forego the right because I don't want to be a hindrance to the ministry. In other words, if people were driven away from Jesus Christ, even if they're wrong about this, it's not my heart. It isn't, it isn't what I would want. It isn't my desire. I'd rather uh, not be taken care of than to have somebody uh, go away uh, from the Lord or from following the Lord Jesus. Anthony, sit down. In verse uh, 13, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live other things in the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers at the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And again, his qualification, but I have used none of these things. Neither have I written these things that should be done, so done unto me. For it would be better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. Paul said ultimately, he said, I don't want to owe you anything. I want... <laughs> to be beholden only to God. To God be the glory. And that's his conclusion. He goes on to, uh, to qualify it some more. But ultimately, ultimately his reason, and uh, in other churches, Paul actually apologizes and said, you know what, I've wronged you by not requiring you to support me as a minister. Friend, that's important for us. See, Paul's concern here, and I love the tone in which he ends this topic, he ends the tone of, with the topic by finally saying, this is my right, I'll defend my right, and I'll also forego my right because ultimately I just want to serve the Lord Jesus and don't want to be a hindrance to Him. And then that leaves it in the laps of the church. Let me ask you a question. If you have a minister or a servant of God, we have a missionary that comes and preaches to us and God uses him. He's serving the Lord in other places and representing us. What kind of people are we if we don't take care of Him? I've had, I've had a lot of evangelists come and say, Pastor, I want to come and I don't want anything from your church. I appreciate the Spirit. That's exactly what Paul said. But I'll tell you what I don't want to be is the kind of church that will use a preacher and not pay him. I don't want to be people. I, shall, I tell people I appreciate your heart in that. you know, And, and some guys perhaps mean it more than others. But the reality of it is, is that if there's going to be somebody taking advantage of somebody, I'd rather the preacher took advantage of me than I took advantage of him. Because I don't have to deal with his conscience, I have to deal with mine. And here Paul just rests in the laps of the conscience of the church at Corinth. And that's what we do here this evening as well. We as believers ought to take care of God's ministers, God's servants. We're going to have the Duke family uh, with us for about 20-something days here beginning in early November and then sometime in December, the end of November and December as well. And you know something? They're going to have to spend some money to come here. They're going to have to spend about $600 for lodging, which is pretty good for 20 days. And uh, they're going to have to spend travel and they're going to have needs while they're here. You know, as a church, we have to take care of them. We have to take care of them, shouldn't we? We've got folks that are helping minister in Miami Beach and they're kind of going at their own charge. But I'll tell you, if they have needs, we have to take care of them. And, uh, you know, if we get a pastor in Miami Beach, you know, one of the best things that church can do is take care of him. Support him. Encourage him. So he can take care of the spiritual things and they take care of the carnal things. And, you know, as a church, we ought to have a good balance of that as well. I have found, as a pastor, I'm just sharing my heart a little bit, I found that sometimes I'm hindered because the carnal things require too much of me. And so I'm not able to take care of the spiritual things. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, oftentimes a conflict in that. And we as a church, we ought to say, you know what, we need to make, make sure make sure that both are in balance. And so there's the word from the Lord for you. And I know it's a terrible message because my wife threw away the notes. But, uh, you know, it's Paul's, really, not mine. So go ahead and give him the hard time for it. Father, thank you so much for using your servant, the Apostle Paul, to really bear his soul in this way and to minister to us. And I just pray that you would help us to be able to apply it practically. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take prayer requests. You need to get up, you can now. Yes, Sophia?